Welcome back. Uh, it's still the run-up here on PLOS TV Africa, and um, we're being joined by security expert of international standing, Mr. Augustin Ega. Good morning, and welcome to the run-up. All right. Okay, good morning. Mr. Yongul, it's, it's my pleasure to be with you. Uh, okay, You're welcome. It's, welcome to the show. Yeah. It's uh, Last time we talked security generally, and we were referring to what the president uh, said about security that um, by December security will be a thing of the past. But right now, the U.S. issued a security warning that some flashpoints in Nigeria will be attacked. And we took it lightly, but right now they're withdrawing some non-essential staff, as they call them, from Nigeria and from these places and are saying, unless you have something really important, especially in a place like the FCT, you should never go to that place. Uh, first question is, should we take this seriously? Is it as serious as the U.S. is making it or we should look elsewhere for this kind of advice? Of course it is serious because the uh, U.S., they are always on top of uh, security issues. They consider security issues as a priority to any other business. Mm. And uh, of course, we, we don't see it from that angle. And that's why we are struggling with everything. We are struggling with the economy. But they see security as a force. If security is laid down properly, they know every other thing will work well. Like I said last time, because of the insecurity, that's why you see uh, people living in Nigeria. There's brain drain. There's so many other issues happening. Security is dependent of insecurity. Uh, I mean, it's independent of other factors that is affecting or plaguing the nation. Right now, we must take it serious because there are, when you, when you do a country risk analysis, there are certain statistics that they follow through before you can profile a particular uh, geopolitical zone and say, oh, this place is not safe or it's very, it's known for this kind of violence. First of all, you remember that in FCT, uh, we have had series of incidents. First, of which kind was, uh, we have this issue between uh, Kaduna and Abuja roads. There are some guys who are operating within that same terrain. On the 29th of March, there was a kidnap case along Kaduna, Abuja. The same Kaduna, Abuja. No matter the proximity, Abuja is still involved. And about 10 people, 100 persons were taken. For six good months, they have been under their, their hostage taking. Again, we have an issue on July 5th. There was also the Kuje prison break on July 5th. About 600 hardened criminals, inmates, were freed. And we don't know where they are. And after this, uh, the Kuje prison break, we had an ambush against the presidential guard, whereby some guards were killed. I mean, presidential guard, all this is happening within Abuja. And we also have the, along the path, we see we have the war killing. Going to, they went to a church, a Catholic church, and they killed almost 40 people on June 5th. If you check from the statistics that we have generally, from 2015, I mean 2015 to date, that is to October, from the statistics we have about 53,418 Nigerians have been killed as a result of terrorism. And we see that the hot point that this is coming from is within Abuja, within the Abuja axis. And of course, like I said, Terrorism is not something, and uh, terrorism is not something that you can properly define. But I know that what really inspired terrorism is our political agitation. Some, they hide it under religious uh, whatever, but we know that it's for political reasons. And the kind of politics we are having now, whereby the three contestants are very strong figures in the three zones. We have the West, we have uh, our own the Southeast, and of course you have the North. It is one of the most highly contested uh, points we are seeing. And it means that there will be a lot of very violent activities going on because terrorism is politics. Because they know that when they get it, they have the economic power. So from this alert from the U.S., I want to believe very well as a specialist that they are very right about it because they see it. There are some kind of predictive uh, uh, model that we use to get certain facts. And we know that this thing will definitely happen. So I think they're on the right path. Okay, Mr. Eger, thanks a lot for the, uh, um, the examples that you gave, uh, just to bring our consciousness back to the seriousness of the, of the matter. Um, there are some people who feel that the US advisory may have been in bad taste, 
uh, looking at the examples you have also given, because there were, there were times when Abuja was significantly threatened and they didn't issue any advisories, you know? And then when it now looks like, according to this, you know, people who feel this way, when it looks like things seem to be stabilizing, suddenly this advisory pops up. What's, what's your reaction to that? In fact, the most dangerous point, sir, is when you feel that you are safe. It's when you are unsafe in security. Because um, they have, if you see the U.S., they have constantly been be issuing advisories. But because of the denial factor in our, our own kind of governance, they don't want to believe. Because normally, it's a, it's a state of panic. People don't want to panic at all. And so they try to cover up, especially politically. They want to give an impression that they're actually working. But as I said, as long as we have poor neighboring countries around us, and Nigeria is somehow uh, an affluent nation within poor nations, we have mm -hmm. most of these attacks that are coming from the profiling. They're actually not Nigerians. Like uh, former uh, Army, uh, Army Chief of Staff, then, uh, General uh, Tijua Janjuma said, he said they are foreign people with very sophisticated weapons and offered his own advisory that based on his military training and background, everyone should defend himself. So on this U.S. issue, if you see their profiling of Nigeria as a whole, they were not specific to Abuja. Sometimes they will say Lagos. Mm -hmm. And what they are passing out now is for people or the governor, the, the people in charge of authority should do something. That is the meaning of advisory. Mm -hmm. They are not saying that you are not doing enough, but they want you to take specific steps to protect the citizens, to protect the government, to protect your economy and your mm -hmm. own people. Mm -hmm. That is why they are doing and they didn't touch only Abuja. They mentioned Borno, they mentioned Yobe, they mentioned Adamawa, they mentioned Kogi, and that these areas, they are prone to kidnap, they are prone to banditry, they are prone to terrorism. And also my own, our own, the, the, the South-South Zone, they mentioned Cross River State Aquai Bomb, and the Niger Delta, the interiors, that is also prone to kidnap and maritime mm -hmm. crimes. Except for that code that was safe, that they described as a safe place. Mm -hmm. If you come down to uh, Bauchi, Gombe, Kaduna, Zamfara, and all those casinos, they also lay the, 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 there's a country risk, there's a risk on that point, they say it's kidnapped. So you can see, risk is dynamic. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow, today is terrorism in Abuja. Next tomorrow, maybe in the next two days, you'll hear that, okay, kidnap is on the rise the next month. So that's how security works, it's dynamic. Mm -hmm. So it evolves, it evolves around the geo zone. There are marauders, the people who keep moving around like you and I, for real normal business. They too, they are going for their own business. They are profiling, they are listening. They are seeing how people feel about security. And when they know that they are lax, they strike. Okay, so just- what the US is doing now is yeah. for people to, is for those in authority of security to stand up to their game. Mm. Okay, you, you, yeah. you, thanks for the panoramic uh, um, um, perspectives. One of the challenges that um, have been identified has to do, and you alluded to it in your, in your remark, the nature of the borders, the international borders that we have, um, especially in the north, where we have yes. a vast desert and the, the borders are not fenced because of the huge mass yeah. uh, of those yes. borders. For me, there are two questions related to this for which I, I would like your perspective. One, okay. how can we properly secure these borders because it will appear as if no matter what the authorities do if those borders remain the way they are fluid it might undermine whatever effort is being made uh, the second associated question to that is that when the military as they have done in many situations drive out threats from some of these areas there are those who wonder whether we actually have enough manpower to actually secure those areas that may have been purged. In other words, are you satisfied with the size of our security forces? Or do you think given the threats facing us, we need to be hiring more people, training more people, equipping more people in order to properly secure what these people refer to as ungoverned spaces? Hmm. Yes, um, those borders, it, most times, uh, there is this, there's something I, I would like to bring to your notice. Uh, very briefly, streets, very briefly, because our see, time is running out, please. Yes. yes, all right. If you go around our, our streets, you see something like national ID registration. And everybody can do it on a, as a business center. 
That card is very sensitive. If one gets that card, he claims he becomes a Nigerian citizen. Hmm. That is number one. I have lived in Borno State in my early life, and I know how most of the people living in Borno, most of them are immigrants from other countries. So if you talk about the space, I think um, there's this inflow of business from that area. It's just like Lagos Port. There is the Saharan side. Hmm. We have customs. We have immigration over there. I think they should do, your, do their jobs. That is all I can say. We have people that are supposed to work in that area. They should mm -hmm. do their job. Okay. And um, in terms of recruiting more military armed men, it is never enough. In fact, they're supposed to be the highest and the most numbered forces in Nigeria. Because if you look at Russia, take for instance Russia and Ukraine, they are even recalling people on reserve. So having a high military number is never enough. Because of external action, it can happen anytime, mm -hmm. any moment, there's no notice. And you just have to deploy. What if you have like four incidents at the same time that is terrorist based in three regions of the nation? How will you mobilize the military so that you okay. keep recruiting? <laughs> okay, Mr. Ega, we, are, uh, yeah. we really wish that we had more time to discuss mm -hmm. this. Security issues yes. can never be exhausted. Another thing we would have yes. asked you was what it really meant to be, uh, or what it really means rather, to be a security conscious but we can't have time to answer that we're hoping to call you again as soon as possible because we'll be talking security until the election is over at least mm -hmm. because we know this is the time to be really conscious about it but we'd like to say thank you to you for coming on the program today to share your thoughts my pleasure thank you Nyambu. thank you thank you all right Bye. that was uh, augustine a guy security expert talking to us about the um the security advisory that the u.s has given to nigeria and nigeria Nigerians and its own citizens uh, and mentioning some flashpoints within Nigeria that should be visited only when it is absolutely necessary. Well, we will take a short break and when we return, we'll, uh, the, the break will be for the news and after the news, we'll take the final lap of this journey. Stay with us. You're welcome back. Uh, before the news, we talked with uh, the SA budget, Cross River State, and it was talking or giving us an insight into the budget of quantum infinitum. <laughs> we know big jaw-breaking words come out of Cross River State when it comes to budget presentations like that. We had at one point uh, uh, cabalistic densification or something like that, and so many other ones. The only one whose name I could understand was Budget of Blush and Bliss. Even then, I was still just asking myself, <laughs> why this kind of names? Why Christian budgets in this kind of way that mm -hmm. a, a common person on the street may not know your intent for this mm -hmm. budget? And I, I think budgets should be named in such a way that the people will understand that this is what our government plans to do. This is what he plans to use this money for. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is the direction he wants to go. So that if you have anything you can key into that, you, you know from the onset this is the plan for this year. But quantum, <laughs> quantum infinitum, you know, it's like, it's like you're attending a Latin mass and you don't understand a, a thing, you're yeah. just saying amen to it. It's, it's serious. <laughs> we, yeah, we, we, we discussed this. Even when we were talking about uh, um, saying that one of the presidential candidates has gone to the U.S. to campaign, yeah. you know, uh, and we said, look, the choice of words um, that our public officials adopt uh, mm -hmm. is very important. They need to be circumspect. It needs to be very simple. It needs to really convey adequate information to, to the uh, population. And uh, of course, with a view to ensuring that the population can engage and can support and can take ownership. You know. But if they don't understand what is being said and have no clue whatsoever, as to what the objectives, you know, of the authorities are, is always very difficult, um, you know, for the for the public to be a part of what is happening, uh, to also be part owners and to promote it, you know. But hopefully, hopefully, we will see changes. Yeah, <laughs> changes in infinitum. <laughs> okay, we also talked with a security expert, Mr. Augustine Ega, and, you know, in, in, even when the federal government is saying that this advisory, this security alert is, is, out of, is blown out of proportion and all that, 
uh, he also warned that everybody should be security conscious and these things that are coming out from uh, America, there are reasons why these things are coming out. But we already know this is Nigeria and a lot of things are happening. You could leave your house in the morning and in the night they're looking for you. And sometimes the enemy is even within. We've seen children who've kidnapped their own uh, parents. Sometimes they plan with their own uh, friends to kidnap them so that they can obtain a lot of money from their parents. One thing or the other. Um, we don't know why this thing is so... We used to watch these things in movies only. Mm -hmm. Now it's happening in Nigeria and it's unfortunate that people will be talking about Nigeria in this light. It used to be a very peaceful country. We never... We never thought a bomb could go off in Nigeria. True. But now it's happening. True. And, uh, I mean, there, there, are, there are a number of reasons, of course, you know. But I think um, one key factor as well could be a total collapse of our values. Um, you know, we used to have what was called the National Orientation Agency. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I assume it still it. exists, you know. And some Nigerians will remember in the days of Professor Jerry Ghana as the director general of MAMSA, mm -hmm. you know, movement, you know, I don't know now what, I can't remember <laughs> what MAMSA means, but it was basically this orientation, you know, and, um, you know. I remember the Andrew advert. That yeah, exactly. Andrew was trying to exactly, check out the country exactly. and all that. So there were so many ways, you know, direct and subtle of trying to influence us into, you know, right keeping thinking. our values, right thinking, behaving properly. But... Frankly, it's, it's, there's a big gap now, you know. Um, people even do things that are wrong and don't even know those things are wrong. The other day we were talking about when people hire house helps mm. and have absolutely no information about where this house help has come from. Yeah. No guarantor. Even they don't have the name. Maybe they only have one name. Oh, her name is Charity. Charity what? They don't know. Or her name is Bosse. Bosse what? They don't know, right? And, uh, and, then it, and, and then this house help connives and there's burglary or something and they go to the police and they're expecting the police to apprehend somebody whose photograph they don't have, mm -hmm. whose names they don't know, whose address they don't know, who didn't give a guarantor. You see? So we need to begin to rethink all these things. And for me, it's not everything that is going to be government. I believe strongly that if the values, reorientation, yes, government has its role, but significantly um, between the, the family, largely the family, to some extent the school, at primary school level, then religious places of worship, Muslim and Christian, or whatever religion people have, they have a very big role to play in this attitudinal shift. Because if we don't address the collapse of the values, even when you try to do the right thing, People will frustrate you mm -hmm. because the value system is wrong. It's like you're stopping at a, at a traffic light. The traffic light is going from green to red. By the time it's shifting to amber, you are slowing down to stop because it's telling you get ready to stop. Mm -hmm. And then people start honking behind you yeah, and telling you to get out of the way. So It'd be like you just come late. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 and yet the same people who drive against traffic the same people whose children are not 18 years old and don't have a driver's license and they allow the child to drive are saying the government is bad. The government is not doing this. The same people who don't use the pedestrian bridge, which is built to enable them cross the road safely, mm -hmm. are also accusing the government. You see, so we need, to, we need to really sit back and, and play our part. This morning I was coming to work and we got stuck somewhere in Bega. Uh, there's a road leading to the highway and we were on that road. Too. We stayed there for like 30 minutes and we felt there was traffic on the highway because there's been traffic, you know, this past few months because they're working on the road. So we felt that was the reason. But guess what? When we finally left that place, we discovered that people were driving on that one-way drive. They were driving against the traffic, mm -hmm. and that's how we got stuck. So multiple vehicles were coming the wrong way, yeah. and we that were on the right way could not Paid move. the price for it. So we stayed there for like 30 minutes. 
until and on the highway, the vehicles were not moving that fast. So for any of them to negotiate and go back, to reverse and go back, was a problem because mm -hmm. there were multiple vehicles yeah. like that. So now I lost 30 minutes coming <laughs> to work because of what someone just mm -hmm. couldn't use their head to do right. Mm -hmm. And when you talked about orientation, it's not as if, okay, we are talking about the days of Andrew Advert, which is in the <laughs> 80s, yeah. uh, and you can say, okay, things have changed. Things have not really changed. Just recently, one of the people who was heading this uh, ministry or this agency brought a slogan, um, good nation, good people, or something like mm -hmm. that. It changed the orientation of the people. We were so proud to be Nigerians. Yeah. At one point, there is this history that in Texas, Texas was a very dirty, dirty place. And the government tried everything to make it clean again, but it didn't succeed. So they now came up with just a slogan, you cannot mess with Texas. And since the Texas people thought they were macho men, <laughs> they were, you know, the powerful men, that slogan alone rested well with them. With them. So you can't mess with, uh, Texas. with, with Texas. Yeah. So messing with Texas will be, you look, can't look for that trouble. Mm -hmm. But again, you cannot mess the, the environment. environment. Yeah. So yeah. that made them to have a rethink and Texas became clean again. Mm -hmm. So sometimes what we just say, the words that we, we say, the, the things we put in people's heads do not necessarily have to be laws that we're enforcing, we're imprisoning them, we're doing a lot of things. They just need to hear the right things being True. said to them. True. The other day, maybe this is a digression, there was news that someone was jailed for 21 years for stealing food. And I was wondering, <laughs> 21 years mm -hmm. for stealing food. Did we even ask the question what led to that? Mm -hmm. it, yes, he committed a crime. Someone yeah. was saying that just day of criminality and a lot of other things. But I was like, okay. Why did this guy have to commit this crime in the first place? Was it that maybe he has even begged for food? Mm -hmm. Or maybe like these things are happening, his entire um, investment, maybe yeah. he's a farmer, yeah. has been destroyed by flood or something. Why did he steal? And then 21 years, no fine, nothing, just 21 no, no years. Suspended for someone, sentence as well. someone who stole food, which for me... Whether we like it or not, it's, direct, it's directly linked to hunger. Yeah, sure. Why is he so hungry that he sure. will go and steal? And then now you're going to give him 21 years. Maybe he's told to feed his family. Mm -hmm. Now, this mm -hmm. family, what will happen to them? Sometimes you tender justice with mercy, with mercy and with mm -hmm. reasoning. Yeah. And perhaps years. he could have been given. I mean, with due respect to his lordship, whoever gave the judgment. But, but sometimes maybe he could have been given a suspended sentence. Mm -hmm you know, uh, to reform him, because now especially our, our penal system is designed for reformation. That's why we change the name from prisons to correctional Correction. or custodial centers, you know, to, to reflect that philosophy. So I feel that, yeah, this, in this case, maybe a suspended sentence, you know, will still reform the person, because mm -hmm. the whole idea is to ensure this person is reformed. You know, and then we look at the root causes of, of, of why he would go and steal, you know, to steal food. And, it's, it's, it's and, then, and then there's the unfortunate thing about the prisons themselves. What are they doing? Do they really check these people? Because when you go into the prisons, you'll find out why so many people go in there as tolerable criminals, if I may use that word, mm -hmm. and come out as hardened criminals. Mm -hmm. Because even the people who administer these prisons or these correctional facilities, uh, so permit me to say, are worse than the criminals that they take there. Mm -hmm. There was a time that the government said, whether it was true or false, that they budget like 13000 per day or something, uh, a lot of money for to every fit prisoner the, fit per day. Inmates, yeah. And I've seen firsthand, there was a time I was doing... Uh, I was a cat case, as it is, in a, for prison, a prison somewhere I was working. Mm. I was going there to minister to them, to talk to them, to advise them and all that. And I saw firsthand the kind of things that happened in that place. They will need people to come out from outside to give them toothpaste, which I know the government provides, <laughs> to give them soap, which I know the government provides, mm -hmm. and even to give them food that will have protein, which I know the government provides, and so many other things that you cannot even say on air. And you begin to wonder, are these 
centers really for reformation or they just go there and make more criminals out of them. values if we come back to values we, we would find out that if i became head of a correctional facility mm. it's my responsibility to ensure that whatever has been appropriated for those inmates actually get values again yeah. you know uh, and uh, Frankly, I mean, maybe because of my experience, I've been in conflict areas, I've seen things, and I've been in conflict areas where you'll be amazed. There was little or no criminality, aside from the combat operations that were going on. And I asked myself, these people are deprived, their country is at war, and you can actually move around, ex except for, of course, areas where they're fighting wars, and nobody would attack you, nobody would steal from you. And I started asking myself, what is the difference? And for me, it is values that they would, I mean, I'm not advocating co combat or conflict. I'm just, you know, using an, yeah. an example. If people had such an extreme situation, and within that extreme situation, they still observe certain behavioral traits. There, there was this picture when this uh, war, Russia, war, uh, Ukraine war, just erupted. Uh, people were fleeing the country. I think Russia, they were fleeing Ukraine. And one side, on one side of the road, there were so many vehicles. But on the opposite side, which was leading into Ukraine, there was no vehicle. And someone was asking, even people running away from a war can still observe traffic roads. Orderly, orderliness. <laughs> orderliness. <laughs> but not here. Okay. And, then, and you'll be hearing the sound of the shelling uh, and the fighter jets, but you're but still, you're still there. orderly obeying traffic rules. Jeez, it was, it was crazy. I don't, even I no, was... We need like, to work on our values. Yes. And, and, I, and, and it's a time for... You know, anywhere we have a mass accumulation of people, maybe schools... Uh, mosques, churches, and we need these places to rise up and play their roles because they have a very big influence in, on us. Yeah. You know, they have a big influence. And then, of course, the government, the authorities have to lead by example. Okay. Uh, yesterday we had a guest here that w was doing something, and I think this is something that schools should copy as well. Um, they call her Grace Nkwacha. She... She goes to communities, builds libraries for them, makes sure the people, the children study, the children read, that reading culture. But, the, but the, what struck me is that she makes sure she organizes community service for these children. So when they go into the community, community and do the things that they do, even if they are going to clean the gutters, they are going to sweep for an old person, they are going to fetch water for someone, they identify firsthand the problems of that community and they begin to develop an unconscious love for the community, which hopefully will translate into patriotism tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So volunteering, uh, community service, and all these things are things that we should start to teach our children from the primary schools. Absolutely. So that Absolutely. when they, they grow up, like this good book says, teach a child what it should be, so that when mm -hmm. it grows up, it never departs from it. Well, well yeah. we can talk and talk and talk today, <laughs> <laughs> and we'll never finish. No, it's good sometimes <laughs> to reflect, and I'm sure our viewers, are, you know, they have their own views as well, mm -hmm. they, they have their own uh, opinions, mm -hmm. but generally we all know that uh, we have to really improve in a lot of areas. Uh, and that both the citizens and those in authority, yeah. we all have roles to play. Yeah. You know, it's not only one-sided. We all have roles to play. And if we play our roles appropriately, we will definitely see a remarkable change you know, in our situation. Okay. Is, uh, the ball is in our court. Let's make Nigeria great as we want it to be. Let's do this thing again tomorrow, or on Monday rather, <laughs> where we'll come back again. You with can the come tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> no. Until then, my name is Nyamgul Agaji. <laughs> I'm Bayolua. It's been a pleasure once again sharing part of your day. Do have yourselves a wonderful weekend. Bye.